so I hope you had a great weekend. Uh, we're going to start the second week of the summer school, and uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the first speaker of today. So today we have uh, Mathieu, Mathieu Geist, and uh, Mathieu is a full professor at University of Lorraine, currently on leave at, uh, at Google DeepMind. He's doing a reinforcement learning in the RL team in Paris. And um, well, Mathieu is one of those few researchers who managed to somehow bridge the gap between uh, RL theory and, uh, and deep RL. So some of you may know him from his uh, nice works that he has on like uh, regularized MDPs. In particular, the one of the one great paper that he wrote with uh, with Olivier and Bruno that we had uh, last week with us. And uh, some of you may also know him from the the papers that he has uh, on uh, actor critic methods uh, in DeepRL. And uh, maybe you've heard of like uh, I don't know the Munchausen trick that I'm sure he's going to mention today. So it's always, it's always exciting to have someone uh, talk about this topic. So uh, I'm sure it's going to be nice. So please, everyone, uh, give a warm welcome to, to Mathieu. Thank you. Um, so I talk about regularization in reinforcement learning. Uh, if it, anything is unclear, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I mean, better if we don't cover everything, but you understand what we cover. Uh, so. Yeah, ready. Feel free to, to stop me if something is unclear, if I'm too fast, or whatever. And we'll do a break uh, at uh, half uh, the lesson so that you can rest a bit. So um, today we we'll talk about regularization and regularization in reinforcement learning. Um, the regularization I will talk about in reinforcement learning is a bit different from what we call regularization usually. So this term uh, can encompass a lot of things. Uh, typically in supervised learning, we call regularization something that will shrink, uh, say, uh, the hypothesis space, that is the size of the neural network you would search in, for example, by putting uh, some L2 regularization on your weight. Uh, this is an indirect way to shrink the space of function you're looking at. But here, it's really different. Here, it's really the behavior. Uh, in reinforcement learning, you learn a behavior, and it's this behavior that we try to regularize. So we'll start with some warm up, uh, things that you should know now, but it's to recall some notations and to make things crystal clear. And then we'll see uh, some case study with two very classic cases, entropy and Kullback lab regularization. And we'll see that basically, once you have done these two cases, you can combine them in any way uh, to create more cases, uh, some being interesting, useful, or not that much. And we'll see what, what is the issue and, and what is the remedy uh, that is uh, been chosen uh, as uh, leaked just before. <laughs> and, um, and then I'll cover uh, some related topic uh, provided enough time. So as a warm up, we'll start back. So you've seen dynamic programming the beginning of the summer school, I guess. You've seen DQN, and, and this few slides are just to make crystal clear that uh, DQN is, in the end, just value iteration, because this is a scheme that I will uh, modify uh, all along the talk, so it's pretty important to have well in mind what uh, value iteration, and uh, value iteration especially is. So, this you should know. It's a closed loop control. Uh, you have an agent that observes states, uh, let me add the notation. Uh, the agent is a policy. A policy will associate to each state a distribution of action. So when you do classic reinforcement learning, you basically often care about only deterministic policies. That is, you want to choose a sole action for a given state here uh, for reasons that will be clear later. We'll look at stochastic policies. That is, we want to add uh, to associate a distribution of, act of our action for each state. We have the value function, which is the expected cumulative reward, and we want to find uh, an optimal policy maximizing the value function over the long term. And for computing the optimal policy, you have a bunch of possible approaches, but one thing which is uh, pre prevalent in reinforcement learning is uh, dynamic programming or approximation of dynamic programming, even if it's not uh, the sole uh, possible approach. So this is basically, again, for the notation, uh, the Q function with the value function, you only have access to the current state, and you, it's hard to compute the best action in the sense of greedy action. So uh, Q function have been introduced to, uh, to address this, and the Q function is the expected cumulative reward when following some policy pi. Uh, 
uh, when you start from a given state and choose a given action A for the first decision and following the policy pi afterward. And uh, this uh, Q function can be simplified to the reward plus gamma, the expected Q function in the next state. Uh, and this is called the bootstrap term. So this is something you should know uh, yet. And you can write this Q function as being the fixed point of the Bellman operator, T pi, that associate to Q uh, the reward plus gamma, the expected Q value in the next state. So I will work with only this guy afterward. The next value iteration is a specific algorithm uh, that, that try to solve for an MDP by solving for the optimal policy. Uh, this is something you should have seen uh, already again. Uh, but uh, the way I presented, maybe Bruno presented it uh, like that, but uh, it's not the most usual way. In the sense that often you see a value iteration as iterating the optimal Bellman operator, T star. But here, I will iterate the evaluation operator for the policy being greedy according to the current Q function. This is purely equivalent, but I want to really see what happens at the greedy step and what happens at the evaluation step. And here, I focus the whole talk on uh, value iteration because it's simpler, because, uh, because it's simpler, because we don't have a, a lot of hours too. But uh, many things that I will uh, tell you today will apply to a more general scheme like uh, policy iteration or even modified policy iteration or over variation. So value iteration, you have the greedy policy. You can define the po greedy policy as being uh, the policy that maximize uh, state-wise the Q function. So it gives you a deterministic policy. Uh, you may have action having the same value, you just pick one uh, at random. And value iteration is a two-step uh, is an iterative algorithm, each iteration having two steps. And the first step is to compute the greedy policy according to the Q function. And the second step, this is called the greedy step. And the second step consists in applying the Bellman operator for this policy to the previous Q function. And this is called uh, the evaluation step. Evaluation uh, is maybe not the right word because you don't uh, compute the full Q function of the policy. You just apply once the Bellman operator, but I'll talk, I'll tell it, I, uh, I'll talk about uh, evaluation in this case. And the more classic form that you may see more often is that the next Q value is the reward plus gamma, the expectation of our next state of the maximum of our action, next action of the previous Q function. This is the classic way, but these two way, these two way of working or writing a uh, value iteration are purely equivalent. And we'll start with this uh, for what follow. And then the question is once you want to, you can do value iteration if you have, uh, say you know the dynamics, the transition kernel, you know the reward function, the state space is small enough, the action space is small enough, you can compute everything. You apply this scheme for uh, an infinite number of iteration and it will uh, converge towards the optimal policy. But uh, often uh, you have a number of issues. The first one is that the model is unknown. That is, you cannot, you don't, you cannot know exactly the probability for a given state action. But what you can do is you can interact with the system and sample a next state from the current state action couple. The second issue is that you have to learn from data that, uh, uh, that uh, allow not knowing the model. And the third thing is that the state or action spaces are too large for uh, representing uh, exactly the value function as a table. So you have to use function approximation, and you can use a linear function approximation, or you can use uh, nowadays uh, neural networks, more or less big. And if you look at uh, the, the value iteration update rule, so this guy can only be approximately represented. If, even if you were able to compute exactly what is in the right-hand side, it will not be able, it will not be possible to, to compute uh, this as an equality. You should have an approximation because you're not sure your uh, space of neural network allow representing any function, and notably this function. 
The second issue related to the model being unknown is that um, the expectation cannot be computed. So when you cannot compute an expectation, what you do is that you will compute an empirical expectation. And what we'll do there is that we'll use a single sample uh, empirical expectation, and it will be enough. And you want to have this equation being true for any state action couple that are possible, but you, you don't, it's not even possible to enumerate all possible state action in your MDP. You cannot go through all configuration. This alone is a super hard problem. So what you will do is that you rely on, on data, the data you have. And so uh, this is how you can uh, somehow introduce DQN to cope with these three issues. Uh, the first issue about the Q function being not possible to represent as a table is that you will approximate this Q function with a neural network. So theta are the parameters of the neural network and you will just try to fit uh, your target to this neural network. You don't know the expectation of the next states, but you can use a single sample uh, next state expectation, uh, empirical expectation. And you cannot optimize over all possible state action couples. So you have a data set of, uh, exp of uh, experiencing the transition by the agent. And you will use this data set to uh, define an empirical expectation of the transition and try to minimize here the square loss between uh, the next Q value approximation and uh, the current target, the, the bootstrap term. And you have basically DQN, so you have uh, a number of additional issues that are area of research by themselves. The first one being how to solve, uh, how to fill the replay buffer or the data set you will use for learning. And this is a big issue compared to uh, supervised learning. In supervised learning, usually speaking, you have a data set which is fixed. Uh, you have research about how to fill this data set, how to create good data for the task you may have. But in reinforcement learning, the data set you have is it something that often you, you have control over. And uh, the way you control uh, the <coughs> data set grow is not well understood. So this is something I will totally skip in this talk. Um, there's, there's also the question of exploration, uh, exploitation dilemma, how to interact with the system such that uh, having diverse enough data uh, but not doing exploration all the time. Uh, this is something I, won't, I will not talk about again. And uh, the other question is when to adapt the, the target network uh, because um, if you look at this uh, equation, this is the target network, the bar, I write the target as bar. Um, if you follow the dynamic programming ID, you would learn as much as possible uh, this Q theta. That is, you would use a huge data set to learn it. But it's much, much more effective to use a much smaller data set and to update uh, the target network more frequently. So I guess you had some course and even possibly practical session on that. Uh, and and this, is, this is just uh, DQN. Uh, so I am spending a bit of time on this algorithm just to show that from um, value iteration, you can go quite readily to DQN on uh, the loss component. And then you have many other aspects of DQN that are super important, but that you can, when you change uh, your value iteration scheme, you will change your loss, and you can all over, all over components of DQN as they are. You don't need to change them. So in the end, you, you work on value iteration, you do some things, we'll see what, and you can uh, just change the loss of DQN, and in the end, have a new algorithm just by uh, changing the loss. And the question also is how good DQN is. Uh, so this is only a partial answer, a very partial answer, but this will be important later. So a way to write DQN uh, for analysis is to say that the greedy policy is greedy, the greedy policy is greedy according to current Q function, and then you apply the Bellman operator. So when you compute the greedy policy, it's max over actions. I will consider mostly uh, discrete actions uh, that are small, in a small enough number. So you can compute the maximum. When you compute the maximum, you have no error. Even if QK is wrong, computing the maximum of QK is not wrong. Um, 
So you apply the Bellman operator and you, may, you, you do some error. And the error are basically the difference between what you compute as your updated neural network and what you would obtain if you were able to compute everything exactly. So epsilon k is just a random error that uh, depends on the learning process, pro, uh, on the learning uh, aspect, and it's it's just a random thing. And the question I will address uh, in this talk is, if I do some error there at each iteration, what I will pay in the end uh, when uh, for the error I will have uh, with respect to the optimal Q function. And one bound is the following one. So it, it's really general because it doesn't, it doesn't make any assumption about how epsilon k uh, is produced. It just you have an epsilon k, it's whatever you want. Uh, you can have a linear parameterization, you can have a neural network, whatever. And once you have this epsilon k, the distance to optimality is the left hand side. So it's a difference between q star and q pi k. So pi k is a policy you will compute with your algorithm. This is something you know, because it will be the greedy policy according to your last neural network. It's what you apply to the system. Q pi k, this guy, is the true Q function of this policy. This is something you don't know. This is something you cannot compute in general. But the bound will say how far is the policy to the optimal one in terms of Q function. And you will have three terms there. The last term is the rate of convergence. It's basically uh, the rate of convergence of value iteration where you do no error. If you put the epsilon uh, to zero, it's pure value iteration, and you have only this term uh, remaining, and it will converge linearly. But if you do errors, you will have a first term. The first term is something that I will call the horizon factor. The horizon factor is because uh, when you are in a gamma discount in MDP, you, it's an infinite horizon MDP that can be uh, uh, with a gamma discount. And you can see it equivalently as I, at each beginning of uh, an interaction episode, I sample a random horizon according to uh, some geometric law of expectation one over one minus gamma. And I will play for this random time, and then I stop. And if you do this, it's purely equivalent to having a, an infinite horizon gamma discounted MDP. If you draw random horizon and you play, uh, you consider undiscounted reward among this episode. So that's why one over one minus gamma is called an horizon, because it's the expected or optimization horizon of your MDP. So you have a square dependency to this horizon, and this is un unimprovable. You cannot do better with value iteration. It's not a proof artifact. And you have the error term there, that basically say that you will, sum, you will pay for a discounted sum of the absolute value of, sorry, of the errors, epsilon j. And this is a bad result in the sense that, imagine that epsilon k is zero mean an IID. It's not the case. It's much more complicated. But if it was uh, zero mean IID, you would expect the scheme to converge towards the optimal policy. And it's not the case at all. If, if uh, it's uh, zero mean, the sum of error will go to zero by the law of large numbers. But in this case, you don't have the sum of error, but the sum of the absolute value of the error. So it doesn't go to zero. The only way for this guy to vanish is that as uh, iteration proceeds, you want the error to go to zero. It's the only way for the algorithm to converge in the end. And it's a very strong requirement. So this doesn't tell everything, because typically what I don't tell here is how do you control this error term? Um, how do you make this error term small? And it will depend on how you, what, what the error term is, on uh, how you do the dynamic programming scheme. How do you uh, generate sample? How, what kind of function approximation you consider and so on? And for DQN specifically, uh, I don't have a more refined bound for this. 
but it gives some ideas of what you need to control in the end if you want to have a guaranteed good solution in the end. And with value iteration or with DQN, you should have uh, this guy going to zero according to this uh, analysis. And we see that uh, regularization uh, 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 allowed to improve this. So now we'll talk about uh, regularized approximate dynamic programming. And we'll see what it is, the many next slide, but basically you want your policy instead of being greedy, I, I take the uh, greedy policy, the pure greedy policy, you will try to soften uh, this greediness. You will try to move towards the optimal policy, but while uh, staying close to ever some predefined policy or from the previous policy of the dynamic programming scheme. So the question of why doing regularization in reinforcement learning um, is something that uh, uh, appears, for example, when you see reinforcement learning as, a, as an inference problem, uh, as probabilistic inference. This is an online of work that has a uh, close connection to this that I won't cover here. Um, it's sometimes uh, used for uh, in enhancing exploration. If you want to have exploration, you should try uh, all action enough. And one way to, to try all action enough is to say, I want my policy to go towards the best action, but I want it to have a high enough entropy, uh, to be stochastic enough such that I continue to do some exploration. Um, there are some arguments about smoothing the optimization landscape, because when you add some entropy organization, the thing is, you can think about it. Um, if you take the greedy policy, the operator that takes a Q function and computes the greedy policy is not smooth. It's not deep sheets. And when you do uh, optimization, it's a big issue, generally speaking. But if you add a bit of entropy organization, as we will see later, it becomes deep sheets. And this is really nice because uh, the function you're optimizing are more well behaved. Uh, there are other uh, reasons uh, that we'll cover in the rest of the talk, but one recent also uh, reason for doing a regularization is linked to large language model, which is a quite hot topic uh, currently. And you may have heard about uh, reinforcement learning being used for fine-tuning large language models. So in this case, the large language model is trained with uh, a large amount of data, and then it's fine-tuned using supervised learning, and then you, you, you do reinforcement learning to learn a raw function that is, say, uh, learn from a human interaction, or human feedback. But in this case, your initial policy, the language model, is a good policy. You want to change it a bit. And the way to change it a bit is to say, okay, I will try to optimize this reward function, but I don't want my reward model to change too much. The, reward model, the language model is the policy. You don't want this language model to, to, to change too much. So you will add some regularization uh, that force the policy to not move too far from the initial one. And this will be basically covered in a, this talk uh, in an abstract way. And here we will focus on the viewpoint of regularized, regularized approximate dynamic programming uh, because, uh, well, it's the one I am most familiar with, but also it, it allows it covering a lot of things uh, and making connections between uh, things that may look disparate when you look at the literature. And a part which is not converted but complementary is uh, regularization in the linear programming formulation of MDP. So this is uh, less classic, but this is important too. The thing is that um, the kind of algorithm you will get, the kind of regularization you, do, you will do, what kind of quantity you will organize are pretty different. So uh, you can have a look at these references, uh, like the first one should be a relative entropy policy search. There are others, uh, but this won't be covered here. So I will introduce some notations to make things even uh, shorter. And the first thing is that one thing you want to do is to compute the expectation of the Q value according to the policy for a given state. So it's a sum of our action of the policy times the Q value for a given state. And I write this as pi dot Q because component-wise it's a dot, uh, dot product. An expectation is a dot product, and I will make a huge use of this notation. And this is a vector which is as big as a state space. PV 
is uh, computing the expectation of the value function according to the next state, according to the current state action couple. So it's a SA uh, vector. With this notation, you can write the Bellman operator as R, the reward plus gamma time P applied to pi dot Q. And the greedy policy can be written as, um, as uh, maximizing over all policies pi dot Q component wise. Because pi dot Q, uh, you, you search for a policy, it's a vector which has uh, all some, uh, which has positive elements summing to one. You work in the simplex. So the argmax is really, uh, over action is really the same as argmax of a policies. So it may seem a bit overly complicated. It's simpler to search for a single discrete action than to search over a vector in the simplex, but this will be useful uh, afterward. And the entropy uh, is uh, written then using this notation as minus pi dot log pi. So as entropy says uh, how diverse your policy is. The policy with maximum entropy will be the uniform policy. Uh, it will have an entropy of log number of actions. And if you consider uh, a deterministic policy, it will have an entropy of zero, which is the minimum possible entropy. And the cool lab divergence between two policies, pi one and pi two, it's not symmetric, and it's pi, pi one log pi one minus log pi two. And this is, uh, if this is uh, bounded below by zero, the only way to have a zero cool back lab divergence is that the policies are equal and uh, it's not bounded from above. And with this notation, you can write the approximate value iteration scheme as uh, you look for the policy pi k plus one as the maximizing of a pi of pi dot qk, and you compute the next q function as the reward plus gamma time uh, the transition kernel applied to pi k plus one dot qk plus some error that you will do because you use neural network or whatever. And one, Maybe important thing is there here, when you write th things like that, you have the greedy step. The greedy step will solve for an optimization problem, which is I want the maximizing argument of pi dot qk. And when you apply the Bellman operator, what you bootstrap is the solution, the maximizer, the, maximi the maximum of this optimization problem, so pi k plus one dot qk. So you have a, a strong connection between the greedy step and what you will propagate in the evaluation step. And what we'll do is that basically we'll uh, change this guy. And what I'm saying is that if we change this guy, it makes sense to change this guy accordingly. So uh, we'll see some example and how to do regularization. Uh, what does it mean to do regularization in the greedy step? So for now, we have uh, this greedy step, I compute the optimal, uh, the, the greedy Q function. And here what I show is the simplex. The simplex uh, is the space of probabilities uh, over actions for a given state, so it's a policy space. And uh, here I have three actions. And the green dot is pi zero. So if I compute, so, so pi zero is the initial policy. If I compute uh, pi one, it will be greedy according to the Q or will compute according to pi zero. And this pi one uh, is deterministic. So it will be on uh, one of the corner of the simplex. And then I compute pi two and pi two will be there and so on. But you will compute a set of deterministic policies. So you will be uh, in the corner of the simplex. Now, if I add some entropy regularization, the entropy is basically the cool back lab divergence uh, towards the uniform policy. And you could replace it by a base policy uh, that you think is a good uh, solution, something you don't want to deviate too much from. So in this case, I compute, I have pi zero, which is uniform in this case. I compute pi one, so the greedy policy would be there. But I want to maximize pi dot qk plus the entropy. So the solution of this optimization problem is not uh, deterministic policy, it's no greedy po uh, stochastic policy. The solution is pretty simple, I'll show it later. 
and you remain inside the simplex. And then you compute pi two, and when you do so, you will compute pi two that will be greedy according to the previous Q value, and you will try to remain close enough to the initial policy again. But you will forget more or less what happens at pi one except for the Q value. Next, you can also say that you want to remain close to the previous policy. So the reason for doing this is that basically you can see, uh, you, you can think of the Q function as a kind of gradient direction. And it's indeed a, a natural gradient of some uh, objective function, but you can think of it as a gradient direction. And when you compute the greedy policy, just pi dot QK, when you compute really the argmax over action, what you do is that you follow this gradient direction with a huge learning rate. And this is something which is, generally speaking, a bad idea in optimization. Your, your function should be super well behaved such that for, for the a big learning step to work. And it's basically the same idea here. You will do error, you will do approximation. So if you do approximation, you cannot relay rely too much on your gradient direction, and you will do small step. And a way to do small step in this case is to say, I have my current estimate of the policy, my gradient direction is QK, and I will do a small step by saying I will follow this gradient direction, but I try to remain close enough to my current estimate, which is pi K. And you, you, if you think about, um, if you're not familiar with mirror descent, it's not a problem, but if you think about Classic gradient descent, you can say that classic gradient descent is basically, I have a current estimate xk. I have my function. I do a Taylor expansion of this function. I linearize this function. And I optimize for this function, but it's linear. So you will go to plus infinity or minus infinity. But you say, I want to optimize this linear function, but with some organization that say, I want my L2 norm to stay up between my new point and the old one to, base, to, to be small enough. And if you do this, it's exactly uh, the Vanier gradient descent that you all know. And here, the idea is the same, but we work with policies, so it makes more sense to consider a cool back labor divergence than an L2 distance. But it's really the same idea. And so, I have my pi zero, I have pi one. This is the same step as before, because the initial policy is a uh, uniform one. But for pi two, I will say, I go towards the uh, the greedy policy, but remaining close to the previous one. And you can combine both things uh, by saying that you want to stay close uh, at the same time to some initial good policy or some initial uh, meaningful policy and from the previous policy. And then you can replace uh, the KL by something else, by uh, say any Bregman divergence, you can replace the entropy by something else and so on. This can be generalized, but these two guys are the one more commonly used. There's another way to do some regularization, which is also linked to this idea of seeing the Q value as a gradient. And the way is to say, okay, I will not be greedy according to the last Q function, but according to the sum of all past Q function. So this is a bit less frequent, and the question is why doing so? And the intuition is the following one. Assume that the QK, it's not, you're not doing value iteration. You do something much more simple. QK is the optimal Q function plus some noise. And you just, you can observe the optimal Q function through some noise. You cannot observe it exactly. And this noise is ID zero mean, so well behaved. If you're greedy according to QK, there's no way your optimal policy will converge because you will pay for the noise for each policy you compute. But no, if you sum the QJ, what you will get is the sum of Q star plus the sum of noise. And the sum of noise, because of the law of large number, uh, the law of large number, the sum of noise will cancel out. It will, the, the noise will go to zero, and you will get the optimal policy in the end. So that's why you may want to do this kind of regularization. And we'll see later that this is closely linked to what you do when you do cool back labor regularization. And next, the question is, should we regularize the greedy step? And as I said before, when you optimize something there, you propagate it here. So it may make sense to, to do uh, both. So you can choose ever to uh, not do, uh, to keep the regularization step as it is, uh, 
And uh, this is a quite current approach in the literature, but it's often the wrong thing to do. Or you can remark that here, if you modify this guy, and given that this guy was initially what was propagated in the Bellman operator, you can modify this guy too. And uh, you can regularize the same way the evaluation step. And this is also often done in the literature, but I, I truly think this is the correct way to do things, at least from a theoretical viewpoint. And here we are, uh, we have, uh, this is what I call mirror descent value iteration because um, this step is really close to mirror descent. Uh, mirror descent being a generalization of basically gradient descent. It's not purely mirror descent because we don't really have uh, a scalar a function that we optimize for. It's really a dynamic programming scheme. We do it on, for each state and um, there's no, we cannot just choose optimization tool to say, okay, uh, I have this assumption, it's convex because there's no function, so it cannot be convex and you have to do other things. But from an algorithmic viewpoint, it's super close to uh, uh, mirror descent, hence the name. And here I write omega, omega can be any convex function. And the negative entropy in the policy, and the negative entropy is a such a convex function but you could choose uh, of a kind of convex function. Uh, most of the results I will present apply uh, readily. And yeah, we can do a case study and uh, then we'll do a, a little break. Uh, first one is entropy regularization. Because I said, okay, I will add some entropy regularization. This is my regularized value iteration scheme question is how to have a practical algorithm from it. And then I answer why would we, uh, what kind of theoretical uh, result we may have. And so this is value iteration with entropy organization. And how to derive a practical algorithm is just by doing exactly the same thing as we did for DQN. We look at what happens when we know everything and then we put approximation where we need approximation and we get a practical algorithm. So here, the greatest step is you maximize over uh, some space. Here is the simplex, pi dot q plus the entropy. Uh, the entropy is a concave function, so it's minus a convex function. And this is something which is very well known in the optimization literature. It's called the legend functional transform, or sometimes the convex conjugate of a given function. This is well studied, and the, the solution of this optimization problem is called uh, the convex conjugate, and it's written omega star of Q, when uh, omega star of Q is the convex conjugate of omega of pi. Mm -hmm. And a uh, useful property is that the maximizer of this optimization problem is a gradient of the convex conjugate itself. Uh, this is mostly useful for uh, theoretical analysis. But if you take uh, the negative entropy, the solution of this problem is well known, and the policy will be uh, the softmax of the Q function, and your, the solution, the, maximize, the maximum, the max over uh, pi dot Q plus the entropy is the uh, log sum exp. So this is uh, uh, written with the my dot product notation, but it's a log of the sum over action of the exponential of the Q function up to uh, the temperature. But what is the softmax? The softmax is basically, it's a soft version of the argmax over action. So instead of putting a weight of one on the best action, you will, pay, you will put uh, weights everywhere and the, best, the better the action, the higher the weight. So if it's, it's a soft version of uh, what we did before. And the log sum x is a smooth version of the maximum. And so, having this analytical solution, Roger. yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, are there cases where um, this update is exactly the same as the one uh, uh, without entropy? Like uh, for some initial policy, is it possible that we do, like the result of each update will be the same as? Uh, taking the R max with the entropy as without the entropy? No, it's not possible because uh, if you take value iteration, uh, 
without entropy, you will compute deterministic policies. So the policy you will have will be deterministic. And if you do entropy organization, the policies will be uh, stochastic. They remain on the, on the interior of the simplex. They cannot be deterministic. Because having a deterministic policy will uh, put some stuff uh, in the optimization problem to infinity. So you, you don't compute the same solution uh, if you consider entropy organization or uh, generally speaking uh, some omega function, you won't compute the optimal solution of the original MDP even without errors. And one thing that I should really add to the slides, uh, I'll do it for the next time, is that what you do is that instead of optimizing for the sum of reward, you will optimize for the sum of reward plus Om minus omega, uh, the policy in the current state. So you change uh, the dynamic programming, you change the reward function, you change the return uh, with this regularization and you compute different things. Okay, thanks. So, uh, how to get a soft DQN algorithm from this? So we know that with the entropy, the greedy policy is softmax according to QK. And I can just do the same approach as for DQN. I know that this is the entropy of the policy. So I just have to change uh, the update rule and I add the red term. The red term basically uh, is the same as, um, sorry. the red term uh, correspond to this term. So I just add uh, this term, the log policy. Give, the policy is not an explicit object. The policy is just a softmax of the Q function. So I have an update that depends only on my Q function and I get uh, a soft DQN just by changing the loss and keeping all the rest the same. And as the temperature goes to zero, we see that uh, we get back to DQN in the sense that this guy will disappear and this guy, which is a soft Rmax, will uh, converge toward a hard Rmax and it will be the max over action in the end. You can write it differently in the sense that we know that the max uh, pi k plus one dot qk plus the entropy of pi k plus one is the log sum exp. So we can um, use this fact and you get directly that uh, this loss function, where instead of having the expectation of the Q function minus the log policy, you have the log sum exp. These are purely equivalent mathematically. Numerically, it really depends how you you got the log sum exp. Uh, these are numerically unstable objects. Uh, there are well-known tricks to make them stable, but. Uh, uh, yeah, when you do, when you code things, you use a function that computes the log sum exp and not compose the log, the sum, and the exp function, otherwise it won't work. And again, uh, this guy will, com will converge towards the maximum as the temperature goes to zero. Uh, it's not obvious from there, but uh, I, I say it. And next, the question is what to do when I have continuous action. If I want, I have, so DQN, it's a pure critic approach. You don't have a policy object because you can basically compute the policy as argmax over action or a softmax over action. But here, the policy, uh, if you have continuous action, the policy cannot be computed because um, you cannot compute the softmax because, uh, in, because of the infinite number of actions. And the idea is to learn it. This is the base of actor critic algorithm. So, one point is that many actor critic algorithms are presented in the literature as uh, coming from the policy gradient theorem. But if you look at what they do algorithmically, like uh, say uh, SAC, TD3, DDPG, and so on, they are basically value iteration approaches. So this still cover uh, this kind of approaches. Even if they are motivated from policy gradient, the final algorithm is closer to value iteration. Anyway, so the first solution is to say I'll take a direct approach. So my greedy step is pi dot q plus the entropy. Here, uh, the expectation of our action is pi dot q. This is really pi dot q plus entropy. The entropy is pi dot log pi. 
uh, up to the sign. So when I have the expectation of our action of Q minus tau log pi, <laughs> this is really uh, my optimization problem that I want to solve. I know that analytically the solution of this optimization problem is the policy being softmax according to my uh, Q. I know it, but I cannot compute it. So I will use uh, neural network for pi, and I will take an expectation of the states I have in my data set around, and I have a loss function, and I will optimize for it. And that's it. The issue there is that uh, this policy, you want to optimize over this policy, and this is a bit cumbersome because with automatic differentiation, it won't work. Um, and so what you can do is that these are more optimization trick for uh, being able to compute the gradient. You can use important sampling to say that uh, the expectation of a pi omega, which is a policy you're optimizing over, is the expectation of another policy time uh, the policy you're interested in over the, the over policy. You do important sampling. And then you can do the reinforce uh, trick, uh, which is quite common in policy gradient approach. Um, and in practice, people don't do this. They will do uh, the reparameterization trick, uh, which is something different. So for this, you can check in the literature. But the important point is that the loss function for, the, for learning the policy directly comes from the greedy step you have in value iteration. And then this loss function is easy to optimize or not, and you have to use some optimization trick to be able to optimize it. But the way to write this loss function is really take what you do in your DP scheme and then put approximation where you need some approximation and you get your loss function. And a second solution, which is how this is presented in the literature, is to say, I know that my uh, optimal uh, policy is a softmax of the Q function, uh, and I will minimize some distance between my neural network and what I know being the optimal policy. Here, it's a reverse kubak labor divergence. And in the end, it's exactly the same uh, loss function. So I think that seeing this as you just take your greedy step in value iteration, you put approximation, you get your loss function, it's much more direct and much more meaningful. And it's also much more interesting in the sense that for the entropy, you have an analytical solution to the legend function transform, but in many cases, it's not the case. You don't have the analytical solution, so you will have to rely on having a loss function even if the policy was uh, with discrete actions. And for the evaluation step, it's exactly the same as for DQN. You, you just use the same thing, you, you add the entropy and you're done. And so this is basically the soft actor critical algorithm that I just described. That was not presented this way, but uh, it's value iteration. And last slide, I guess, before uh, a short break. So the question is, what, what, what do we compute in the end? This is a good question. What do we compute in the end? And uh, with what guarantee? And we can do the propagation of error, much like we did for OB4. And the bound is this one. So we'll bound the difference between the optimal Q function minus the Q function of the policy computed by the algorithm, but it's Q tonal. And this is a biased solution in the sense that uh, Q to star is not Q star. And as I said before, Q star will be uh, the optimal Q function for the sum of reward. The Q star to will be the optimal Q function for the sum of reward minus the regularization term of the policy. And this might not be a problem. It's bias, but maybe this bias is what you want. Uh, if you take the example of a large language model I talked about before, what you want is to remain close. So the unbiased solution is a Q to. It's not the Q. But if you add some regularization for over uh, reason, for example, for exploration, you add some entropy to have better exploration, you should know that in this case, you compute something which is biased in the end. And the bound in the right hand side is the same as uh, for DQN. So this may suggest that it's not interesting to do so, which would be wrong because uh, 
It may be interesting because the regularization term is something you really want to take into account because you have some prior knowledge which is important and you want to incorporate it in your problem. Or uh, it may be wrong because it's only uh, one specific analysis of this kind of things uh, that overlook a lot of other aspects that you will have in reinforcement learning. For example, it doesn't take anything about the control aspects, the exploration, exploitation dilemma. It doesn't tell anything about uh, how easy it's optimized, it's easy, how it is to optimize uh, the related function. And typically when you take policy gradient approaches, you can also add this kind of regularization and you will have much better convergence rates just because of this added regularization. And there are other reasons and uh, theoretical analysis that suggest that having this regularization is a good thing, but from the purely approximate value iteration scheme viewpoint, we don't gain anything, but we don't lose anything, which is also a good thing. So I guess we can do a short break, uh, maybe a five minute break before continuing. Okay, so now, uh, callback lab organization. And so we have uh, the same scheme as before, I replace the entropy by the callback lab regularization towards a previous policy. And uh, same as before, and we'll do the same approach. Uh, we'll skip maybe continuous actions. Um, so in this case, the greedy step uh, is again uh, a Legend Fenchel transform. It's always the case. And I say, it's not that obvious, but I say that uh, the greedy policy is proportional to the old policy times the softmax. So it's a softmax, which is weighted by the previous policy. And with a direct induction argument, given that pi k itself is greedy, is uh, proportional to pi k minus one times exponential the previous qk and so on, you can show that this is softmax according to the sum of qk. And this is the link I told before between uh, uh, the way to regularize towards the sum of q function or kubak labor divergence being uh, basically the same. What the kubak labor divergence does in this context is that it implicitly assumes, uh, uh, it is in, in, implicitly averages the, the QK, the past QK you've seen. And what you can get is that from, um, you can get an equivalent uh, approximate value, value iteration scheme that I call dual averaging. Uh, you have the same thing, uh, kind of duality between mirror descent and dual averaging in uh, optimization. But basically I say that I know that this will be uh, proper softmax according to the sum of QK. And I know that the softmax is itself uh, related to the Legend transform of the entropy. So here I say that it's pi dot HK, HK being the average of Q value plus uh, the entropy with some temperature because I know that the solution of this optimization problem is exactly this guy. So it's just uh, a way to write it. And uh, HK plus one is the sum of, uh, it's really the sum of Q value, the, empiric, the average of Q value. And I have the evaluation step which remains the same. So I add uh, something new, the H, but it will be uh, useful later. Yeah. Um, I have a small confusion about. Uh, I have a small confusion about how we use uh, free regularization. Uh, I have a small confusion about how we use free regularization. So um, I don't know if there is um, an analogy between this and having um, a prior where we sample from tasks and then we execute this task by. Uh, conditioning on it, the policy, and then having a, a trajectory, and then it's like trying to minimize um, um, the uh, the bits of information that we are initially going from to uh, bits of information that uh, we cannot actually predict in order to make the task predictable. Is it related somehow to what we're doing here, or it's different? Yeah, you can see this as, a, so the question is, uh, can we see uh, this as having a kind of prior uh, over policies? So yes, yes, you can see this like that. Uh, I'm not sure to what, so, so you may have this connection in the literature, more on the literature in, in, a, in a control as probabilistic inference, but because you will uh, more, more likely work with the Bayesian stuff. But here, 
you, you can really see the policy towards which you regularize as a kind of prior that you don't want to move too far from, but you, but you want to change uh, still. Okay. You, you can interpret things like that. Okay. Thank you. And this prior, in the previous case of entropy organization, is just a uniform one and kept, uh, is, kept, is kept fixed. While here, it's more like you solve a, su a succession of problems where you change your prior uh, at each iteration. And one alternative way would be to say, okay, I have some policy and I, I take the coolback lab with respect to this policy and I solve for the MDP until the end. I get an optimal policy and this will be my next prior. And then I, I will use it for a new MDP and so on. And here, what we do is that we're optimistic in the sense that we change the prior at each iteration of the algorithm, which is more efficient uh, because you have to do less compute, less samples, and so on. So a practical algorithm from this uh, is uh, this one. So the issue now is that um, if I have a Q network, I can compute the softmax over the Q network, but Weighting it by the previous policy, which is itself a softmax over the previous network, is not easy. And so if you take things uh, in this form, um, you don't have really a choice. You have to introduce a policy network. Because um, you cannot compute this guy. Uh, if the parameterization were linear, it will amount to make an average of the parameters that works. But uh, with neural network, it's not the case. And uh, so you have to, and if you want to compute it over this form, if you have the previous policy, you could do it. But this previous policy itself has to be represented. If it's implicit, it's uh, this guy. So we'll see later uh, a smarter way to do this. But for now, the way to do this is to say, as before, OK, I have the greedy step. I wrote my greedy step as uh, expectation of a stuff. Uh, so it's just a dot product which is written as an equivalent expectation. I put an expectation over the data set I have uh, around this, and I get a loss function. And then I try to optimize for this loss function. And I have to introduce uh, some uh, target policy network, and I have my current policy network, and I optimize over this current policy network, and uh, that's it. I have a loss function. It's not the, the, the best possible approach. Another approach would be to say, okay, I know that I should be softmax according to the sum of Q, func of Q function, so let's try to learn this sum of Q function using a uh, neural network. So basically here, I say that um, I try to fit on H, uh, one minus alpha the previous h plus alpha times the q value, which is uh, a moving average instead of having an average of the q functions. And this could work also in practice. So uh, this approach, uh, we tried it, uh, it works. This approach is called momentum DQN because it was introduced uh, from a different perspective, but it's really this in the end. Um, it was introduced from a different and earlier perspective. And for the evaluation step, uh, as before, you, you just take uh, the exact equation, you put approximation everything, and you're done. And the question is, what do we gain uh, theoretically? Because it's a bit more complicated. Oh, one, one thing also is that um, I think canonical example of this are uh, trust region policy optimization proximal policy optimization that you will maybe cover this afternoon. So you will see them this afternoon. And what they do is they, they use this idea of uh, trust region, as they call them. Uh, it's really the same idea. I don't want to move too far from my current policy. And they do it using different approaches. But the, the core idea is the same. But this will be covered this afternoon. And so, uh, not this after all. And so what do we gain? And this is what the bound we had before. It's uh, approximate value iteration. And we had uh, the sum of the norm of the error. And if we look at the bound we get with this uh, kind of regularization towards the previous policy, what we get is that instead of having a weighted sum of the norm of the error, uh, 
we have the norm of the average of the error. And it means that if your errors are well behaved in the sense that they are zero mean IID over iteration, this means that this guy will go to zero. And it's super important to be able, exchanging the, so the sum and the norm are not commutative, and it's really super important, it's very super different. And here you have an, uh, an empirical illustration on just a tabular NDP, it's a very simple setting, but this is value iteration that doesn't converge, approximate value iteration that cannot converge because the errors never goes to zero. But using a uh, callback cool lab organization, uh, you do converge to zero. So you can compensate for errors uh, along iteration. Um, the thing is that if you look, uh, you have another thing is that here you have a square dependency to zero reason, while here you only have a linear dependency of zero reason, which is also a very strong uh, thing. And you lose something here in the sense that no, the convergence is sublinear. But it, it makes sense because value iteration has a linear convergence and what, how do we modify value iteration? It's by saying that instead of doing the big update, we do a much smaller update. So if you do much smaller update and if you have no errors in the end, uh, it will be slower. You have to pay it, uh, there's no free lunch. And yeah. Uh, just going back a bit, like the last slide. Yeah. The, on the very left hand side, should this be Q star tau on there? Yeah. No, no. In this case, no. Uh, that's an excellent question. In, in this case, I don't have entropy regularization, so I don't regularize towards something which is fixed, but I regularize towards my previous iterate uh, within the algorithm. And in this way, what I will compute in the end is the optimal solution of the original MDP. I don't have a bias as before, but I could add some entropy regularization and get this bias back. Thank you. Uh, changing the bounds too. But yeah, yeah, that's an excellent point. So in this case, it's not obvious that in the end you compute the right quantity. Uh, it's the case. So a quick overview. Uh, I will go quickly over, but uh, this is a, a quite uh, not exhaustive at all list of papers that deal with some form of regularization. And what you do is that basically you can uh, regularize uh, ever uh, the evaluation or not. As I said before, you always regularize the greedy step. The evaluation step, you could regularize it or not. You can put entropy, cool back labor, both. And then you have a bunch of algorithm, also depending on many other aspects. One thing is that uh, part of this algorithm have not been introduced with a regularization viewpoint. The connection to, in the end, you can derive the very same algorithm using uh, the regularization perspective, but it was not the case for, uh, when the algorithm was written. For example, uh, uh, momentum DQN was introduced uh, as a kind of way, seeing this gradient uh, view of Q function, it was introduced as a way to do like a momentum in gradient in optimization by summing the Q function and the link to regularization was made uh, afterward. So uh, there are a bunch of work that use this kind of ideas and many more now uh, in practice with uh, LLM again. Uh, so I think I will skip this part, uh, but basically you can get an analysis of what happens for uh, depending on uh, if you put entropy, cool back, both, uh, in the evaluation step, in the greedy step, uh, or both. Uh, and this basically is, uh, this is known as softmax DQN. You put entropy there, but you don't put uh, entropy there, and this may not converge even without errors. This is a known failure case, uh, in the sense that you have a kind of implicit Bellman operator by and this, and this Bellman operator is not a contraction, you can, comp you can build example where this Bellman operator has more than one fixed point. The fixed point is not unique and so on. So the TLDR here is uh, if you change this guy, change the other one too, it will be much more simple. And uh, in practice, it may not change much, but uh, it's nicer, I would say. Uh, so I'll skip a bunch of slide, uh, so yeah, it's basically you have bounds, uh, 
uh, that resembles quite a lot uh, the one I've uh, shown before. Another question is, we, we have uh, Kubak regularization is nice because it implicitly averages the Q function, and by doing so, you implicitly average the error, and you can converge uh, when value iteration cannot. And that's cool. Uh, but I want to do deep reinforcement learning. And in deep reinforcement learning, we, we have this uh, equivalence. These, these are the two schemes I have shown before. If you do this, as I said before, you can put uh, an expectation, uh, write the dot product as an expectation, put an expectation of a state on your data set and define a loss function, optimize for it. But if you do this, you will do error there. And my analysis, my nice bound, does not suffer from having error error. If you add error here, uh, you lose the average of error. And you can say, okay, I'll take this form then, and if you take this form, you have errors uh, in, this, uh, in this approximation because you cannot just sum things, except if you remember all the past Q networks, but this will be quickly super expensive. You want to avoid having a memory of hundreds of networks. So uh, the two schemes are not equivalent. And so my analysis does not hold, and so why doing this in, uh, in reinforcement learning, uh, in deep reinforcement learning? So the analysis came because there were a uh, super efficient approach doing this, uh, especially in the policy gradient area with things like TRPO. So it works, it's more like how to make uh, the algorithm closer to the analysis uh, such that maybe it will work even better. And uh, also, this thing is not really compatible with stochastic approximation. Uh, basically, if you don't re replace this by a moving average, it might not work well. And a remedy is a Munchausen trick. Uh, so, Munchausen reinforcement learning is a paper, but it is basically how to do uh, practically um, uh, cool back label realization with the theoretical guarantees within a deep reinforcement learning context with discrete actions. But the trick uh, is more widely useful and uh, I think useful to know. And so uh, we can start from this and recall that um, the Kullback label between pi and pi k is pi dot log pi minus log pi k and you can put the log pi k with this guy and so on. You can write a bit, you can check the paper, I have not done the derivation here but it's pretty simple. And what you can do is that, so I write a Q prime K here. And Q prime K is really the Q function I was talking about before, the same as QK before. And then I just do a, a reparameterization trick, that is I will uh, define Q prime K plus alpha tau log pi K as QK. And I write everything as QK and it works. And in the end, this is the scheme I have so it's really like, if you take everything but the red term, it's a uh, soft DQN or uh, value iteration with entropy regularization. And here you have the Munchausen term. And that's it. So the thing, the idea here is that instead of learning, uh, this is homogeneous to a Q function, so Q prime. This QK is homogeneous to a Q function plus the log policy, but the log policy in essence, we'll see that later, is an advantage function. So what I do is that instead of learning the Q function, or instead of learning the Q function and then trying to learn uh, an approximation of the sum of the Q function, I have a clever way to learn directly the sum of Q function. Because in essence, QK up to a state baseline that I don't care about is the sum of Q prime K from the past. So this is a clever trick to learn directly the sum of a quantity uh, instead of directly the quantity. And it's useful in over context too. And that's what Munchausen does. And, and so you can uh, modify uh, the algorithm as follow. So this is uh, the DQN loss as before. I add some entropy organization as before, it's a blue term. I add the Munchausen term as before, it's a red term. 
and that's it. It's just a tiny change of the loss function in the end. And what is super important here is that the log policy has a different uh, sign. With a minus, it's the entropy. With a plus, it's not the entropy. So I'm not just uh, writing an entropy term elsewhere. It's pretty different. And one way to think about it also is that when you do DQN, what you do is that I don't know, if I knew the optimal Q function, Q star, I will apply this, uh, this update, I will get the Q optimal Q function, but I don't know the optimal Q function, so I will replace it by my best current estimate, which is my, car uh, my target network. Now, if you take this term, if I knew the optimal policy, then taking the alpha log optimal policy, let's say the optimal policy is deterministic, it will, it will be zero for optimal action and minus infinity for uh, suboptimal actions. So just bootstrapping this term would give me uh, the optimal Q function or something which has the same best action because I would set everything which is not opt optimal to uh, minus infinity. So you can see this as a way to kind of bootstrap the information you have in the uh, policy too. And that works well because if you take, uh, this is DQN and this is uh, Munchausen DQN just by changing uh, a bit the loss by adding the alpha log policy. Uh, so it's a small change uh, algorithmically, but it makes a big change uh, uh, empirically. And it works because it works thanks to uh, the fact that Kuhlbach Labor Organization is doing uh, uh, error averaging over iteration under the hood. Uh, and yeah, it's an improvement over games. Uh, so you can check the, the paper, but the thing also, the nice thing is that you have over improvement of uh, DQN, for example, IQN, uh, which stands for, uh, it's not uh, implicit quantile uh, networks. And IQN is a distributional reinforcement learning approach. So I don't know if you had a course about it, but it's quite orthogonal to what I talk uh, just so far. And you can add the Munchausen trick to this IQN it's the same thing, basically, you, have the, you add the alpha log pi to the policy and you, you earn uh, things and it works better. So, why does it work? Another viewpoint uh, is the following one. So, we add the alpha log policy term to my uh, basic soft DQN. So, soft DQN, in a sense, so from my own experiment at least, soft DQN doesn't really work better than DQN except if you tune really uh, the entropy for each problem you consider, you can get a bit better result. But there's no consistent improvement of soft DQN over DQN, at least on the Atari games I just shown before. But uh, so what, what changed is really the log policy term. And if you look at the log policy term, the policy itself is softmax according to the uh, this Q, but this Q is now uh, homogeneous to the sum of real Q function and not to Q function. And it's Q minus uh, the log sum X of the Q just by a basic uh, computation. And in the end, if you take the limit as it goes to zero, you get uh, the Roi plus alpha times the Q value minus the max over action of the Q value in the current state. This is the advantage function and this scheme is known as advantage learning. So, and advantage learning is something that we know can work well, but uh, so far was not uh, really analyzed. Uh, uh, we, we were not really understanding why it was working. There were some analysis, some uh, argument for why it was working, for example, on the fact that there are some consistency. But what, what we show is that uh, advantage learning in the end is doing a form in the limit of uh, Kullback labor regularization. And this connection is not super well known uh, in the literature, but I think it's super important. And um, the thing is that if you look at uh, the advantage function, it's actually, it defines some of the action gap. And the action gap is that, say I have the optimal Q function, Q star, and I take uh, the difference between uh, the first best action and the second best action. If this difference is super small, 
then it will be hard to learn the best action because my, uh, if I have more noise than uh, the difference between the two actions, it will be super hard to learn. And what you can show, uh, it's done in the paper, is that if without Kubak Labor Organization, you have an action gap, which is a say gap, you add Kullback Labor Organization and you will get a gap that will be one, minus al one over one minus alpha uh, dilatation. And typically we'll take uh, practical alpha will be dot nine. Alpha is uh, the weight between Kullback Labor and entropy organization in this case. With alpha equal to dot nine, uh, you will have a time 10 increase in the gap. So it does not always, uh, you cannot always this time time uh, empirically, but it works better and we can observe indeed uh, an increased action gap uh, in, in practice. And basically the increased action, action gap say, may, may uh, says that you can uh, more easily learn uh, your Q network. Um, I guess, five. So, uh, I'll go super quick on uh, the last thing. There, there are um, a lot of related topics. So one is that, um, so this is a part of theoretical analysis uh, that asks if I have access to a generative model, that is I can uh, query a simulator for each state action couple, I can uh, call the simulator and time for whatever state action couple I want. And the question is what is the minimum, minimal time, uh, number of time I have to call my simulator? How many samples should I use in this very simplified setting to g learn an epsilon optimal policy? This is called the sample complexity. And uh, basically this slide tells that uh, we have shown that uh, doing a coolback labor organization is minimax optimal. That is, you cannot do, uh, minimax optimal in the sense that there's no algorithm that will uh, need less sample than uh, doing this. Uh, there exist over approach that are uh, minimax optimal, but they are either model based or uh, they are model free, but much more, much more complicated. Um, so Munchausen is super nice, but the issue is that it works only for discrete actions because you still need to have the, the softmax. And this is something uh, which I think is also interesting is that if you want to have uh, it's a way to have a soft an action. Uh, if you want to be soft max exactly according to your Q function, with continuous action, it's not possible. But yes, it is. And how is it? Is that you will define your Q function implicitly as to log pi. Pi is an explicit policy network plus v of s, and v is an explicit value network. So instead of having a Q function and a policy you have a policy and a value function and you define your Q function implicitly as the log policy plus the value. And if you do so, you have, um, it, it's, it's direct, but uh, the softmax of the implicit Q is the explicit pi. So you have an explicit policy and you can replace this and get a loss and uh, but that may not work super well because what you do in continuous control is that uh, you will often take a Gaussian policy because it's simple, which means that this guy is Gaussian, which means that basically you force your Q function as being a function which is quadratic in the actions. And this may be an object which is not rich enough to represent the true Q function or to bootstrap the Bellman operator. And, and so you have, a, you have a, you have an exact softmax, but you have moved the problem elsewhere, which is on the representation power of the policy. Uh, you can use this kind of ideas for exploration in the sense that what we've seen so far is that you remove, you, you have a, a cool back lab term, but say, I want to stay close to this previous policy, but you can add a change the sign and say, I want to deviate from this policy and to deviate from this policy to perform some sort, some sort of exploration. And this, this uh, works pretty well uh, in some setting. And uh, so on, this is, uh, so I don't know if there's a lesson on offline reinforcement learning, it's quite a topic currently. It's basically you want to learn an optimal Q function, but you don't have access 
to the simulator. You just have access to data. This is really super hard. And many approach what they'll do is that they'll try to regularize towards the, the behavior which is in the data. And uh, so you have uh, more or less explicitly uh, a lot of regularization ideas there in this uh, setting. Um, in imitation learning or inverse reinforcement learning, this regularization is important uh, too uh, from uh, mostly technical purpose. And for uh, game theory or multi-agent reinforcement learning, again, I don't know if there's a lesson on this, but uh, when you do a game theory, when you take uh, any kind of approach, you, you want to learn to play against some opponent, you have to make a lot of assumption about the game and so on. Uh, but in the end, you have not to play about uh, the strategy of your last opponent, but about some kind of averaging of what your opponent did in the past. Otherwise, it won't converge. So when you do games, you have to, you have to average someone, more or less explicitly, and you can use this kind of trick as a mean chosen trick to, to learn implicitly uh, the sum of something. Uh, and I, I guess that's it. Thank you for your attention. Um, question or break? Questions? Yeah, so I'm a little curious about the suboptimality uh, comparison between the um, reg KL regularized and the um, uh, vanilla vanilla Q iteration, or sorry, value iteration. Now, um, what you showed in your graph was that there's some dependence on the convergence bound with uh, lambda, right? The KL regularization, like learning rate type parameter. Yeah. Um, but the bound has no dependence on this, and furthermore. Uh, it, do, it has a dependence on tau, which looks monotonic. There's no trade-off between different uh, kinds of terms. I mean, it looks like a regularization type term that you might see in a regret bound. Now, um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could sort of make a few comments about that. It, it looks like the um, suboptimality bound that we're seeing doesn't really capture all of what you see in practice. Do you? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, when you have only lambda, basically the higher the lambda, uh, the slower the convergence. You have this, uh, you have these two terms in the bound. Uh, having a higher lambda will make the, the convergence slower, but having a higher lambda will also make the averaging less efficient. And um, this is when you have only cool back lab organization. If you have both, uh, you don't have a pure average. You will have a kind of moving average between uh, uh, a moving average of the error. So what we will propagate is a moving average. So it's not sufficient for cancelling out uh, regularization, uh, cancelling out the noise, but it's sufficient for reducing uh, enough uh, the variance uh, of the for reducing yeah. the variance of the of the sum of noise. Yeah, but then you might expect like to see some partial dependence on the uh, infinity norm of of the um, uh, stepwise uh, um, errors, right? Um, but you don't see that at all in the in in this bound. Um, like there seems to be a discontinuity. Uh. Okay. So the thing also is that these errors that I will do will depend on the kind of regularization I do, hmm. because they come from uh, fitting this regularization term. So there's hidden dependency of these errors uh, to this, and in general, it's super hard to say. Uh, what will be the influence of uh, what we do before in this error that will, in, in this case, uh, influence again. But if you take, uh, so, uh, sorry, this, um, this paper. So uh, uh, it's a paper showing that uh, it's minimax optimal. In this case, we do uh, a quite specific setting, that is we have access to a generative model and we do uh, this kind of scheme by seeing that for each iteration, for each state action couple, we call for m sample of uh, the next state. And then we do the MDVI stuff. And then we say how to tune uh, the temperature of lambda, how to tune the temperature of tau, uh, how to tune the number of time you call for the generative model, such that in the end, your minimax optimal, and we optimize above these bounds. But you have to make uh, the 
So this error explicit if you want to, to get this kind of, uh, of results. Empirically, if you take Munchausen and DQN, the alpha is basically the ratio between, um, you have alpha and tau. Tau is the pure temperature, somehow, how much bias you want to put in the MDP. And uh, the alpha is the ratio between the cool lab atom and, and the entropy term. And basically, the, the TLDR is take alpha to dot nine, it works. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe we can stop here and take the questions uh, offline, so we can ask the Mathieu uh, directly, and we can go to for the coffee break. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mathieu. Thank you.